Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AFTD educational webinar, The Role of Occupational Therapy in FTD Care. I'm Esther Kane, AFTD's Director of Support and Education. On behalf of everyone here, thank you for joining us today. A few housekeeping items before I introduce our guest presenter. Please note our audience will be muted for the duration of the presentation. This helps to keep the background noise to a minimum so that everyone can hear the presenter clearly. If you have any technical issues, please write a message in the questions box and our very own Matt Osga will be get, get back to you as soon as he can. There will be time for Q&A at the end of this presentation. Please type your questions in this box as you think of them. Don't wait until the end. We will address as many questions as time permits. Additionally, this webinar will be recorded and archived on our YouTube page with all our education or webinar webinars. Visit youtube.com slash theaftd.org to find our webinar playlist. Before we get started, I have one quick update. If you haven't saved the date already, AFTD's 2022 Annual Education Conference will take place on Friday, April 8th, 2022. The event will be held in person, state and federal guidelines permitting, at the BWI Airport Marriott near Baltimore, Maryland. AFTD will ask all in-person attendees to show proof of vaccination. The conference will also be live streamed online. Registration will launch early in the new year. Stay tuned for more details. At this point, I would like to introduce our guest presenter. Maureen O'Neill Brown is an occupational therapist with over 20 years of experience in treating individuals with neurological disorders alongside their families. Maureen works as an ambassador of Cognitive Concierge, a nationwide virtual health and wellness company where she collaborates with clients and their families to identify area resources, provide advocacy, and problem solve to achieve person-specific goals. Welcome, Maureen. We are very glad you are here. And now I turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Esther. I appreciate that nice introduction. I wanted to start by saying thank you to the entirety of AFTD for having me on. Um, this is a great opportunity to share how occupational therapy can help folks and their care uh, caregivers with um, AFTD. Um, I also want to specifically thank Esther, Will, and Matt um, for all the assistance that you've given me for um, starting this presentation. I also wanted to say how um, grateful I am that the um, AFTD is doing such a great job with a multidisciplinary approach, um, having neurology, having PT, art therapy, speech therapy, all come on to do educational seminars um, for folks who are looking for information. I think it's a terrific approach. It's, it's ideal um, for having folks um, with um, FTD and their caretakers, uh, caregivers, um, to be able to get that information that they need. So thank you so much. Um, I want to, um, Will, if you could advance to the next slide, we can go to our introduction. So FTD is a very challenging neurodevelopmental diagnosis um, involving all aspects of function. Occupational therapy is going to be playing an important role in assisting those with FTD um, to engage at their highest level of function and independence with daily tasks. Um, we also want to include very meaningful activities. We're going to use a holistic and person-centered approach um, to identify strengths, areas of need, and priorities of each individual. We're also going to work collaboratively with the individual, the family, and the entire team to problem solve issues and identify best practices to maximize function and quality of life. Well, if we could go to the slide for financial disclosures, you can see my financial disclosures and affiliations.
I will read through these. Um, the financial disclosures, I do not have any financial disclosures. Um, affiliations of a member of the um, AOTA, which is our governing body. Um, I'm also certified as a res, um, registered occupational therapist for the National Board of Certification in Occupational Therapy. In addition, I hold licenses as an occupational therapist in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Illinois. Um, also, I'm the ambassador, one of the ambassadors for Cognitive Concierge, and um, I am a candidate for Brain Injury, um, a Brain Injury Association of America's Certified Brain Injury Specialist. Thanks, Will. If we could move on to the learning ob objectives for this presentation. These are the topics that we're going to be focusing on today. The learner is going to be able to um, differentiate occupational therapy from physical therapy. In addition, the learner is going to be able to describe at least three examples of how OT intervention can benefit a person with FTD. Also, learner will be able to identify two ways to investigate or initiate OT care in the community. Thanks, Will. So occupational therapy, um, it is a very distinct um, therapy in that the name means nothing to a lot of people. I have had a number of people when I walk into a room or meet a family for the first time, turn me, turn me away saying, thank you, I have a job already or I am retired. Um, the name occupation is um, a long-standing um, long standing definition. We, we go back to 1917 when World War I started. So that definition is the older definition of occupation, which means doing. So you want to be able to help someone um, via occupational therapy with what they do. So our areas of, um, our areas of skill are going to be in helping folks with um, activities of daily living, which include things like bathing, dressing, um, making meals, um, instrumental ADLs, which include things like driving, bouncing a checkbook, um, increasing, um, addressing health, rest and sleep, work, play, leisure, and social participation. And those are all the areas. It is a very tough um, a tough therapy to describe because there are so many factors involved in occupational therapy. In addition, we range from um, being doing therapy with neonatal um, um, intensive care units, in addition to geriatric population. So we go, we span the ages. Um, in addition, as Johnny Cash says, we've been everywhere, man. So we um, anywhere there are people you'll see an occupational therapist so you'll find occupational therapists in hospitals in schools uh, you'll also see them in um, workplace settings um, you may see an occupational therapist doing um, post-surgical care so there are many um, many niches for occupational therapy the niche that we're going to talk about today is specifically for cognitive um, behavioral issues, visual perceptual issues, motor issues with um, frontotemporal degeneration. If we can go on to the next slide, Will. So a lot of people, um, when you meet an occupational therapist, they'll say, what, what is occupational therapy? And sometimes the pat answer is, well, it's kind of like physical therapy, but it's a little different. So um, I know um, the AFTD had Erica Pitch um, speaking in, during their last presentation, um, terrific presentation. She went over um, occupational therapy and physical therapy differences. So um, I'm gonna refer you um, specifically to that presentation for more information. But I did wanna go over some differences here today. For occupational therapy, um, you're going to see that they are experts in the areas of improving, improving and retraining skills for function with daily tasks. So we are going to start with a holistic approach on how to view cognition, motor skills, behavior, safety, psychosocial functioning, and how all of those affect activities of daily living, um, in addition to the instrumental ADLs as well. 
we're going to do an activity analysis to identify strengths, areas of need, ways to compensate or rehab skills to improve function. Physical therapy are experts in motor planning. They are going to be working on things like walking, balance, transfer, safety, muscle, um, muscle movement, strengthening. Um, they are going to be doing a task analysis and break down every aspect of those motor skills to be able to improve performance um, with those with the with those motor skills as well. Um, we're we're going to take a very team um, oriented approach, whether it be occupational therapy or physical therapy. We're going to be providing clients and family um, education so that we can follow up with those skills throughout the day, throughout the therapy. We're gonna be constantly reassessing and problem solving, and we're gonna be using an evidence-based practice for both occupational and physical therapy. Well, if we could advance to the next slide. So some of the, some of the challenges with FTD are very unique to the diagnosis. Um, it is the most common dementia um, for folks under 60, which means it's going to be impacting work family and life responsibilities. Diagnosis of this um, diagnosis can be very difficult because it mirrors many other ones. It can be um, very confused with many other diagnoses. So to be able to get a good diagnosis is going to be critical. It is going to be requiring a different pre uh, treatment approach um, because most of the time the memory skills for this um, diagnosis is going to be spared. So you're not gonna be having to work with um, memory problems per se, but there are going to be other differences um, that you will have to um, address. In addition, um, it's a very complex heterogeneous presentation with a variable progression rate. Um, as well as the challenging behavioral and cognitive issues, communication issues, movement and visual perceptual di dysfunction. Um, these can create a very complex situation for individuals and caregivers. If we could move on to the next slide, Will. Um, I'm gonna start with behavioral variant FTD. Um, this is one of the variants of FTD. And um, during one of the share of stakeholder meetings that we had with some of the family members um, who joined us, these were some of the most challenging behaviors of FTD. What I will do is go through these and then we will talk about them on the next slide in depth. Um, so these are, these are some very challenging types of behaviors, um, apathy, um, loss of empathy, impulsivity, um, some perseveration or compulsive behaviors, um, anosognosia, uh, wandering. Um, some folks will have uh, hyper, hyper orality or specific food preferences, um, mostly um, sweet food preferences, so dealing with that as well, um, as well as hypersexuality. And then if we can move on to the next slide, thanks Will. Um, one thing that we need to really address um, right off the bat is um, folks with behavioral concerns with this diagnosis um, they're not doing these on purpose. These are not behaviors that are generally um, volitional. So we want to make sure that we say that right off the bat because sometimes it can seem as though uh, this, you know, this might be doing um, that. This might be for an alter ulterior purpose, but in general, it is not. Um, so I want to make sure that we say that right off the bat. Um, the other thing is we cannot change this diagnosis, so we need to change the environment and our approach. So we are going to be working on behavioral specific strategies. Um, we want to be able to um, educate the care partners to help loved ones with facial expressions, reading the room, and be able to get information from the environment. Um, sometimes we will use gestures rather than specific um, verbiage. 
Routine is going to be critical. Um, structured, meaningful activities are going to be very, very important to be able to have those behaviors um, under control. We also want to be able to match the activity and the skill level um, and tailor that for the person. We want to be able to look back on things that um, have been enjoyable in the past, uh, as well as possible new activities that might be enjoyable for folks. So we want to make sure that the activity and the skill level are going to be able to match that because we also don't want to create an environment where there's frustration with the task. Uh, we want to structure the environment so folks are safe. We want to um, optimize participation. Um, we want to be able to um, use safety equipment. Um, sometimes um, the need for alerting local first responders if there's um, wandering issues is also very, very critical. Um, there have been um, there there are a number of adaptive equipment and techniques that we can use for safety. So being able to um, have a person not wondering um, whether it be using um, alarms, alarm systems, the phone, um, tracking, being able to um, redirect so that that wandering does not happen. Um, we want to be able to work with food preferences. Um, like I said, many of the time, um, many times there's a sweet food preference. So folks will tend toward the cookies and the chocolate, and being able to work with those, um, work with those food issues and add healthy options, and limit the stock of overconsumed unhealthy foods. Um, using verbal cues is going to be very important as well to be able to discourage disinhibition or off-color comments. Um, exercise. Um, I don't. Um, I'm a huge proponent of exercise and being able to um, have someone be um, in the natural light, being being active during the day. Um, it helps in a variety of ways with behaviors, with sleep. Um, as well as um, as a um, as a distractor as well. So being able to exercise um, can help a, a variety of issues, um, especially some of the behavioral issues. Uh, when we start to think about some of um, some of the financially based um, in, uh, financially based decisions that folks have to make. We may want to think about uh, talking about power of attorney, durable power of attorney for finances, especially if um, financial you know, checks are being written or money is being given away um, to be able to uh, address some of those issues in a more specific way. Um, the, the other thing, the overlying thing here, um, fostering feelings of usefulness as well. Um, meaningful activity, responsibilities, and success. It definitely will help um, to um, improve, improve affect um, and improve feelings of worth. Well, if we could advance, oh, thanks. Um, some overall behavioral considerations. Um, we wanna make sure that, again, that overarching um, a tenant of this is not a volitional behavior, um, but understanding that the environment can play a part in um, decreasing or increasing some of these behaviors. So, having have, maintaining a calm, non confrontational demeanor is going to help in every single case. Um, being being there to listen, um, validating the emotion um, behind that behavior. Assuring safety. Uh, what is the message behind the behavior? Are folks um, who are having behavioral issues feeling as if they're worried about something? Are they worried about safety? Are they worrying about um, what is the cause of that behavior? So trying to figure out um, and allaying fears to be able to let the person know that they're safe is, is oftentimes um, one of the most useful things that someone can do. Um, 
healthy habits. Um, we talked about exercise, routine, super helpful. Um, I have all of my folks, we talk about routine and what you do day to day. The brain is already working really hard. Um, so having a routine, so you do not have to think about every single step of the day is going to be very, very helpful. Um, daytime alertness um, with a light exposure is gonna be very helpful with sleep help. Um, redirecting, remove, disassembling. I've had many folks who have um, talked about, you know, you know, my 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 partner wants to work on, um, you know, this uh, this project, uh, and it, it requires power tools. Um, well, what do we do with that? We need to keep a person safe. So looking around and seeing where a person is at, seeing where their function is, um, having them be um, part of that activity, but being able to uh, use, use the safety techniques to be able to have um, a, a safe experience. Um, journaling is super important as well to be able to get a very good idea of the patterns of behavior. Um, we've heard uh, about sundowning, um, particular times of the day when behaviors might start to get um, amplified. So it may be that, it may be um, a certain period of time during the day when someone is anticipating uh, something will happen. So having that journal of, um, journal of activities that occur within the week might be able to give you an idea of what um, types of behaviors are happening when and what is the trigger. Uh, respite is going to be critical. Uh, this is, this is a very challenging 24-7 um, type of um, diagnosis sometimes. And to be able to have the, um, the care for yourself, to be able to be present for your loved one is going to be essential. To be able to have your health, to be able to be present and be um helpful for your for your loved one i cannot say enough about having respite and respite could be going for a walk respite could be going to the grocery store um just to get a little bit of a break um absolutely critical you may want to engage your neurologist if some of these behaviors start to get very troublesome um, you might want to talk to them about some medications, SSRIs, um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety med. Um, and we also want to assess that environment for triggers. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. So some of the triggers that we often see, um, some of these we've talked about, but is there pacing? Is there anxiety? Is there speaking louder? Um, is my loved one getting, uh, letting me know that I need to go somewhere? I need to, I need to get in the car. I need to pick up so and so. I need to go somewhere. Um, and what is the energy level of the room? Is there a lot of activity? Is there a lot of noise? Is there loud multiple conversations going on? We want to make sure that we're addressing those because some of those things will actually increase the behavior. Again, sundowning, we talked about that. Is it a factor that we need to consider? Maybe it's not sundowning, but it might be a different part of the day. Are there some unfamiliar people in the room that we need to um, let our loved one know who they are and, and why they're here? Uh, are others pacing or raising their voices or showing signs of some escalation? And then lastly, we're all going to be tired, hungry. We may um, we may be feeling under the weather. So, is that a factor that we need to consider for our loved one that is increasing these behaviors? If we can move on, well, thank you. Um, so, communication issues. Again, I'm going to refer. I'm going to go over some of these um, some of this information. 
excellent, excellent, excellent presentation um, by my colleague, Becky Kayum, um, that um, presented for the AFTD over the summer. She did a really terrific job with um, going over primary progressive aphasia. And um, I would refer you to that for more specific information. Um, but let's talk about the three big groups of aphasia that um, are common with FTD. Um, the semantic variant, um, gradual loss of the meaning of words. You may have some submissions. Um, and then the loss of the ability to understand some simple words. Fluency is retained. Um, so you, a person may, may be able to talk and talk and talk, but there may not be um, as, as much of uh, that deeper, a deeper meaning in the words. The non-fluent agrammatic aphasia, more of a motor issue. So effort, effortful halting speech. Um, sometimes words are going to be mispronounced um, or they might be used um, for an opposite, say yes for no. Uh, hot for a cold, uh, war, word order might be disorganized. So you may have the end of the sentence at the beginning of the sentence, um, decreased comprehension for the longer sentences. And the logopenic, um, most often this is associated with Alzheimer's disease. So a person knows what that word is, but they just can't get it out of their head. So they may have difficulty with naming objects or recalling words, but they know the meaning of the word. You may also find some word substitutions, um, circumlocution. So we're talking around the topic, but we're going to eventually get to it. Oh, you know, the thing with, uh, you know, Mary did that and her brother. So being able to, um, you know, this, this is a situation where um, folks are looking for a word. Um, fluent and casual conversations, um, uh, some mispronunciations. All right, specific strategies for communication issues. Again, I'm going to refer you to um, Becky's talk, but let's talk about some of the, some of the communication um, strategies that we can use right now. Um, you're going to want to get involved um, with a speech and language pathologist, specifically one that has um, a good background in neurocognitive um, skills. So they are going to be your best friend for communication issues as well as speech um, as well as swallowing issues as well um, however some of the things that we have um, implemented for our um, our loved ones with ppa a lexicon or a communication system and this can be very low tech it can be very high tech so we can use things like um, uh, an ipad with pictures on it that someone can point to um, with uh, specific and specific and, and um, most useful words on there. Um, or it can be very low tech where you may have a flip board or um, pictures of things that are um, very useful during the day. Um, pictures of people, pictures of objects that are um, that are used, juice, milk, water, preferences for food, um, preferences, you know, talking to someone on the phone, being able to say, I want to talk to Mary or I want to see so-and-so. Um, education is going to be very, very important to family and friends to be able to help them understand what your loved one is going through and be able to give them strategies um, for helping communication. So, well, we need to make eye contact. We need to make sure that our loved one is looking at us and hearing what we say. Um, we may need to turn the television down. Um, we may be, um, in, instead of yelling from across the room, come on closer. Um, speaking clearly face to face, using gestures, um, specific, specific verbal cues. Um, do not, do not give a three-step process, one verbal cue at a time. Using that picture system is gonna be really critical. Um, communication wallet is also um, handy to have for portability. So if you're in a restaurant, um, you may be able to 
or, or out in the community, be able to have that with you to be able to point to something that you um, are communicating. Pictures on the phone are gonna be very, very helpful as well. We are gonna have that with us at all times. Um, speech generating devices for more high tech. You could also use talk to text. Uh, information cards on a, in your wallet are also going to be very, very important, um, both from a communication and a safety standpoint, so that if there's any question, um, we have that very important information with us in our wallet. A practice script is also going to be, um, has also been very, very helpful for folks. So especially in the um, non-fluent agrammatic PPA. Um, so if, for example, you are going to be calling your doctor, um, having that information ahead of time written down to be able to practice and say, I'm Jim Jones and I need to talk with Dr. So-and-so about the specific issue. Um, having that available in practice um, is going to be very helpful for folks, especially, like I said, with the agrammatic PPA. Um, Practice patients um, and offer reassurance. If it's if it's not a good speaking day, it's not a good speaking day. It might be, again, it could be the behavior, it could be in the environment, it could be that um, the you know your loved one may not be feeling optimally that day. Um, it it helps with practicing patients. Um, Working in a quiet environment is going to be critical as well because you don't want to have anything else that is going to be distracting um, when you're trying to trying to think of your words. So in addition to some of the communication um, issues that we might see with FTD, there are also some movement disorders as well. So we want to make sure that um, folks know that these might be a, a factor to consider. Um, as the as the disease as the, the disease process spreads within the brain, um, it will sometimes get to some of those motor areas. So we might end up seeing some weakness, um, generalized body weakness. We might have um, hemiparesis, which is weakness on only one side. Um, there may be some issues with some motor planning. So um, a person may not know how to do a motor movement appropriately to um, you know, make a pot of tea. Um, okay, what do I do first? What do I do next? Um, being able to um, know how to grip, know where to place, motor planning issues. Um, kinesthetic proprioception and body and space awareness um, are sometimes also seen with um, FTD. So a person may be, say, Riding, a, riding their stationary bike and they may feel wobbly. So not being able to know um, where their body is and being able to plan for that in advance. Um, there may be some increase in muscle tone, um, also called spasticity. So um, some tightness in a muscle that um, wasn't there prior. And um, as we, uh, we'll go to the next slide after this and I'll talk specifically about uh, these, these in detail. The, um, in addition, there are some rare associated neuromotor diseases. Um, again, very rare. Um, ALS type of disease, uh, motor neuron disease, cortical basal degeneration, and um, progressive supranuclear, supranuclear palsy. Your, um, your neurologist go is going to be super helpful to be able to um, partner with you um, to be able to go over some of these um, neuromotor diseases. Again, very rare. Um, they're going to have you, um, they're going to be able to hook you up with one of the OTs, PTs, speech therapists that deal specifically with these types of neuromotor diseases um, to help help partner with you. You may see some Parkinson, um, Parkinson's type 
um, a Parkinson type of disease process. Um, so you may have um, bradykinesia, which is a slowness of movement. You may have um, micrographia, which is a very small, tiny writing, um, some swallowing issues. Um, in addition, um, later, later in the stages, um, there may end up being some bowel and bladder incontinence as well. Um, and you'll notice that bowel and bladder incontinence are in the movement disorders because they are muscle-based, they are not behavioral. We can move on to the next slide. Thanks, Will. Um, for, and we can go over, I'll, I'll highlight some of, the, some of the important parts of this very meaty slide here. Um, weakness, um, for weakness, we're gonna be working on some strengthening motor control, moving your body every day. Um, we may need to adapt equipment. Um, so for example, if there's um, weakness, we may wanna use some adaptive equipment such as lightweight utensils or mugs. Um, we may wanna use some adaptive clothing if there are some coordination issues. Um, for motor planning, we want to make sure that we do a task analysis of the um, activity that is difficult for a person. So we want to go through and see where that task is breaking down. Um, we may want to use, um, we may want to skip using utensils and, and use finger foods instead. We may want to fill cups halfway rather than all the way full. Um, we want to um, look at fasteners as well, um, as well as using just enough verbal or visual cues that will assist. Um, we don't want to overdo the information that we give to someone. Kinesthesia, we want to try and look at the safety around the house. Um, so you may want to talk to your OT about a home safety evaluation. They're going to be able to walk you through the specifics of your home to be able to talk about what may or may not be an issue or options for um, safety in the bathroom, safety in the kitchen, um, using furniture positioned appropriately, um, clearing the paths to find perimeters, um, anti-spasticity positioning and stretching um, for, um, for that increased tone. You may want to talk to your neurologist as well, because there are some medicines that can help with that, um, especially Botox um, and um, Baclofen. And um, exercise, again, I've said it before, it's super important um, to be able to get exercise in um, for many reasons, whether it be the movement disorders or the behavioral um, types of challenges. Having um, Having your OT, PT, and speech, um, we talked about this um, during the last slide, um, specific with neurological background to help you with some of those rare motor dis um, disorders um, associated with this um, is gonna be super, super, super important. The um, Parkinson types of um, activities um, or Parkinson's types of um, challenges that uh, folks may be facing can certainly be helped with some physical therapy and occupational therapy, as well as um, speech for increasing vocal volume, um, working on those swallowing issues. Um, PT um, is going to be working on some of those larger motor movements to be able to increase step length, um, working on safety with um, walking and balance. The um, for OT, we're going to be working on things like, can we use an adaptive equipment such as a built-up pen to increase the size of writing? Incontinence issues, um, again, very, um, very important to know that they're not volitional. Uh, it is a, a motor issue rather than a, a behavioral issue. For the incontinence issues that may occur, um, it is very, very important to sort of document what is the what is the trigger if um is there a pattern here are there nonverbal cues that my loved one might be giving me that they need to use the bathroom um it, very very important to sort of start that process establishing a toileting schedule is going to be very very important um 
usually um, about 20 minutes after someone would um, take in a meal or a beverage, um, you want to try and have have your loved one try and use the bathroom. Um, liquids during the day, really important because you don't want them to get dehydrated, but you want to sort of back down and restrict some of the liquids at night. Decreasing caffeine intake is going to be a very, very um, helpful thing as well. And then using a calm approach, um, because again, this is not a volitional type of issue. Um, we need to have patience with, um, with any of these issues that are occurring. If we can move to the next, thanks, Will. Um, visual and perceptual issues. This is something that um, as, as this um, disease process continues to move um, into different areas of the brain, um, sometimes you'll see some of these visual perceptual issues. Um, depth perception, being able to judge a distance. So that's going to be critical with things like walking or stairs, um, putting something on a table. You may have visual field and attention, which means that the brain is um, not telling a person to look completely over to one side. Processing information um, and the comprehension of visual information, similar to PPA, where that comprehension um, of verbal information is um, decreased, processing of visual information can also be uh, decreased as well. So a person may look at something and see something completely different. Um, you know, it might be turned around, it might be uh, on its side. Um, they may not get the information in and process it properly. Reading is also, uh, reading can also be a very challenging task in that um, a person may jump lines, you're reading one line and you end up jumping down to the next line, or um, a person may not be able to see over to the beginning of the sentence and the end of the sentence. Um, Visual planning and organization, being able to, again, organize all of the information that you need to be able to um, complete an activity. Um, color contrast and um, figure ground. Basically, be, you know, having the ability to uh, see an object on a same color background. Uh, so a white plate on a white table or a white shirt on a white bedspread. Um, for example, uh, very difficult to pick out for some folks. Balance and confidence also can be um, affected by visual perceptual challenges and as well as safety. Thanks, Will. Uh, this is an area where, um, again, a home safety evaluation is going to be a very helpful thing to have. Um, an OT can go through, be able to go through um, a, a day in the life of your loved one and be able to walk through and address some of the things that may be a, a current safety issue or may become a, 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 a safety issue and be able to address some of those things with safety equipment or an alternate way of completing that activity. Using adaptive equipment or adaptive techniques is going to be helpful. Um, for example, um, reading, um, as we talked about in the previous slide, sometimes we'll have folks um, use either like an index card or a ruler um, to be able to mark their lines going down as they're reading. We may do page markers with a um, line on one side and a line on the other side so that visually you're able to go through and um, read from one side to the other side with that visual cue. Um, Decreasing visual uh, visual clutter or completing or competing visual stimuli is going to be very important. If um, if a person is in their kitchen and they're looking for a specific thing on the counter, and you may have uh, jars or um, plants or um, other competing visual stimuli there, um, that person is not going to readily be able to um, visualize and get what they need. So being able to decrease some of that information is going to be helpful for that person to be much more independent. 
uh, clearing paths, um, obviously for safety purposes. Um, also scatter rugs. Uh, scatter rugs are, are something that PTs and OTs will um, will tell you to get rid of right away. Um, sort of standard fare, no scatter rugs. Uh, in addition to the sort of slip and fall um, concern that a PT or an OT might have, um, there's also a visual perceptual um, issue as well. So sometimes a, a rug in, um, in, in a doorway will look like a hole. And so that, that becomes very challenging visually for, um, for someone who's having some visual perceptual issues. Um, Always uh, safety on the stairs in the bathroom and with transitions. Um, super important, again, a home safety evaluation will be super helpful to be able to um, catch some of those things that might be potential dangers. Using contrasting colors, um, like I said, a white plate on a white tablecloth is going to be very difficult to see. So having, um, having a contrasting color um, there is gonna be help, uh, helpful for that person to be much more independent. Um, organized tools and supplies. Um, if you've got your junk drawer, as I do in my kitchen, you're having trouble finding things in there. So um, having an organized approach with um, your tools and supplies is gonna help with that independence as well. Also considering safety with instrumental ADLs. So, a person is, um, this is going to be pretty important and, and sometimes a challenge for folks. So if a person is looking to complete a task that they have enjoyed doing in the past, um, most, most often um, driving will come into, into mind. Um, we need to consider safety with um, tool use and um, and instrumental ADL. So we need to have that, that conversation about what is safe to use, um, whether it be from a uh, cognitive standpoint or a visual perceptual standpoint. Um, some of these are tough conversations and having the team with you to, um, to back you um, or to um, help with that conversation um, might be, might be a, a good thing to do. Presenting items in the visual field. So if a person doesn't realize that um, or can't, uh, their brain is not telling them to look all the way to the left, um, sometimes it, it will it will scare a person to have information coming at them so quickly um, or, or seemingly out of nowhere. So being able to present information um, cognizant of the fact that that left visual field or that right visual field might be decreased um, and slowing the speed of the presentation so it doesn't feel like they're coming at them um, so quickly. So where can you find an OT? Um, there are a few areas that might be helpful to investigate. Um, most often you're gonna be talking with your doctor and um, a doctor will refer you to an occupational therapist, probably the easiest way. Um, however, um, you can also find um, ways to get through um, and, and find an OT through home care. Um, the nurse that will be in the home um, doing an assessment can, can make a recommendation for um, OT services as well. Um, we've also had outpatient physical therapists or speech therapists refer or recommend an occupational therapy evaluation as well. Uh, social worker or community or town nurse. Um, the um, research trials as well, um, or the research study team. If there's a trial that is happening, you may need to follow the rules of either no therapy or no occupational therapy um, until that trial is over. Um, but that is another way that um, a referral can be made for OT, as well as your area agency, uh, agency on aging and um, VA as well. Funding sources, a variety of funding sources. Um, obviously, private health care, Medicare, Medicaid, um, but also VA benefits. Um, 
Area Agency on Aging can also be very, very helpful, um, as well as some other state agencies and local agencies. Uh, the AOTA, which I had mentioned initially, uh, our national group will partner uh, as well with some OT-based um, services. Uh, so that's definitely an avenue that might be um, might be good to investigate. And then there are some other um, agencies in um, varying states that have OT services available as well. And I've, I've listed some of those um, down at the bottom there, the capable and the steady. In addition, um, it's not necessarily an OT service, but um, one thing that I do want to put a plug in for is um, consider applying for um, SSDI or having a conversation with your doctor about applying for SSDI or SSI. Um, FTD is on the list of compassionate allowances, so the process moves a little more quickly, um, but that's definitely an, um, an option as well to look into. So why are OTs especially good at working with individuals with FTD in their families? So OT is going to use a person-centered and holistic approach. Um, we do use evidence-based research to drive our best practices. Um, our scope of practice can, um, will cover all domains of daily functioning. So we're going to look at everything from the minute you get up to the minute you go to bed. Um, we're also going to be team players. So using that um, multi-team approach with PT, OT, nursing, doc, um, art therapy, um, social work, um, we all want the, the same thing, which is to increase the independence of the person with FTD. Um, we're also going to use a continual process of reassessing and problem solving and planning, and we treat the entire family. We're not just treating the person with FTD, we're looking at their entire community of support um, to be able to allow them the best options for independence and meaningful, meaningful life activities. Here are some resources um, for additional information. Um, I, I can't say enough about the AFTD. Um, they really do have a, a wealth of information on their site. Um, the AOTA as well has excellent information about occupational therapy and the speech, our, our sister um, American Speech and Language Hearing Association also has terrific information as well. Um, I did put the Rare Dementia Support Group um, link on there as well. And um, in addition, the Cognitive Concierge Group that I work with um, can offer some additional resources um, as far as FTD and OT. Thank you, Maureen, for that insightful presentation. We will now take questions from the audience. Please use the question box to type your questions and we will answer as many as time permits. Can you talk a little bit more about incontinence and how you may be able to help somebody who's having um, behavioral issues with incontinence? We have some people who have a tendency to um, maybe spread it or it gets messy and they don't know how to manage it. Do you have any tips or tools for people in that type of situation? Absolutely. Um, very challenging behavior, um, very challenging type of um, type of issue. Um, one of the things that I will say right off the bat is again, trying to address the address the or the the issue with um, information ahead of time. So being able to find out what is the inciting issue? What is the in, what is the environment looking like? Um, is there a situation that um, will cause this type of behavior? Um, is a person is a person um, has a person been incontinent and then has been sitting or has been you know not cleaned for a little bit of time, um, or um, is it uncomfortable? So being able to journal that information, um, being able to get a, a feel for um, the pattern of behavior that may be happening is probably your first line of defense. 
Um, in addition, um, being having a very um, have a very calm approach as much as possible. This is a very sort of emotionally written type of um, issue. So having a very calm demeanor when you are addressing that issue with your loved one um, is also gonna be super helpful as well. The um, types of incontinence briefs are gonna be very helpful. I've had folks who have said, oh, I don't want to encourage um, incontinence by having folks wear a brief. No, absolutely get the brief on. It is going to be very, very helpful. Um, and and um, I think that's, I hope that helps. No, it is. And it makes a big difference in the process when they have incontinence supplies on hand. It can make absolutely. it a lot easier for the caregiver and for the person who is experiencing the issue. Absolutely. Um, we have somebody from our audience who's asking a question regarding her loved one has FTD with ALS. And so he is struggling with, he can stand and pivot, but he's uh -huh. struggling with being able to transfer him from his transfer, transport chair to the toilet, to use the bathroom. And um, what recommendations might you give her to be able to help her with that? Okay, um, so I'm assuming that um, with the diagnosis, they have tapped into their um, physical therapist and their occupational therapist as well. Um, from an OT standpoint, um, the um, some of the things, some of the tools of the trade, um, using the Versa frame, having the grab bars, um, are going to be critical um, to be um, to be able to help with that um, transfer. Um, and, and doing it safely. Um, there is a transport, so I'm understanding there's a transport chair and um, um, I guess the nitty gritty of it is the having some safety equipment is going to be critical. Having a home evaluation is gonna be critical as well because as, as ALS will progress, um, the needs of um, for equipment is going to, to change and it may change fairly dramatically, an OT is going to be able to predict, especially an OT who, who knows this family is going to be able to predict ahead of time, oh, this might be an issue, maybe we'll get this on board. Um, so definitely tapping into the OT services as well um, as the PT services to anticipate some of those needs. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit more, Ian? To, we have families who say all the time, my loved one had occupational therapy when they were first diagnosed, or they had <laughs> physical therapy a long time ago, but um, they really couldn't help much, so what's the point now? Can you talk a little bit about the benefit of asking for a referral again um, when you come up with these types of issues? Because I hear this quite a lot from families where they just were like, a lot of their questions are, they can have somebody come back out to the house again and come do another assessment based on where the person is now. So anything you can share about that? Absolutely, thank you. That was that's a great question. Um, so uh, this is a very challenging diagnosis, and so being able to be on board with whatever um, whatever assistance you can have, it is such a changeable thing, um, and and so many areas of function are touched by this um, diagnosis. So having an OT evaluation or a PT evaluation, super important. Um, however, being on top of that to be able to address those changing needs is going to be critical. So what may have been um, superfluous initially may be very useful um, at this stage of the game. And again, having, um, having eyes on the environment, eyes on your loved one, eyes on you, to be able to anticipate some of the things that might be helpful um, that, that maybe you hadn't discussed initially um, is, going to be, um, is going to be very, very useful for a family. I think too, when the therapist comes to the house, they might make different uh, suggestions and have a different plan based on where the person is now than they did two or three years ago. And That's so, correct. Um, they can help you. And I think the role too of therapists and their ability to help with adaptive equipment and help make referrals is just so important um, for families to recognize that they can ask for an eval just for that. They can ask for somebody to come to the home just to have somebody come in and give um, suggestions for postural devices or, you know, a home evaluation, like you're saying, 
um, and in other areas. And typically when they do come, they'll find other little ways that they can Absolutely. help support the family also. That's make right. That's correct. Here for everyone involved. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm just reading through some of these um, questions that we have here. Uh, Have you ever experienced or seen people with FTD who have issues maybe exiting or entering places? With that visual spatial that you were talking about, that sounds like that's that's what we're talking about here, but can you just elaborate Absolutely. a little bit about the entrance and exit and how that's affected by visual spatial? Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a very, it's a very interesting um, situation where sometimes these types of issues will crop up. Again, it wasn't there initially, and then all of a sudden it sort of morphs into this. Um, so from a um, from an adaptive standpoint, one thing that um, one thing that can be helpful is that practice. So if you're going to a place um, with that type of door, uh, if it's a familiar place that you're going to be going to, continue to practice it. Go in there. Um, talk it through with your person, with your loved one. Um, okay, so these doors are gonna open as soon as we approach this curb cut. Now the doors are gonna open. There's a mat, a black mat um, right on the other side of the door. You're going to feel that black mat under your foot. And then there's gonna be a white floor right after that. So talking through the procedure. The other thing is, um, pretty much with anything, you're gonna try and do some of these tasks when it's not so busy. Um, so can you go into that store or that area um, restaurant when it's not as busy so that you have the time to be able to talk through that and take that procedure slowly. Um, and it, if it's, um, you know, it, if it's not a good day, you try it a different day. Thank you so much, Maureen. You have been wonderful. And this has been so helpful for so many of our uh, listeners today. The chat has been full of thank yous. Thank you for this information and how valuable it is um, for the caregivers who are at home. And then hopefully some occupational therapists will find some creative ways to work with those with FTD. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Esther. You're welcome. That's all the time we have. Maureen, thank you for uh, being wonderful today. This has been great. We hope you find this presentation to be informative. We'll, we will post the recorded webinar on AFTD's website under news and events and send out the link as soon as it is available. Our next webinar is part of the Perspectives and FTD Research webinar series, co-hosted by AFTD and the FTD Disorders Registry. On January 27th, Dr. Nupar Goshal of Washington University in St. Louis will join Dr. Penny Dax, AFTD's Senior Director of Scientific Services, to discuss FTD biology and testing. Watch for information and registration via email in the next few weeks. Thank you all for joining us today. Please let us know if you have any comments or questions about today's presentation. Our helpline is always available to help you. Have a great day.